We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Great to see you all here this morning. I, before we get into part five of five in our series called This Means War, I have a special announcement I'd love to share with all of you this morning. We're, uh, we're starting to feel the pinch of the number of people coming into each of our services. You probably feel that a little bit in here. It's a uh, last uh, two weeks ago, we actually hit a, a new record attendance of 1,350 people on a Sunday, which is pretty cool. Um, What's happening with something like that, by the way, that's about doubling in size over the last 18 months, which is crazy. Uh, but what, what we're going to do to help offset that and to make room for more people to come and meet Jesus and worship with us is we're announcing today, um, kind of making it official, that we're launching a <coughs> fourth service. <laughs> um, so hey, let me tell you a little bit about it, and you can get excited with me, hopefully, maybe not. Um, uh, we're not going to add another Sunday service because my legs can't handle it. Maybe in the future I'll start working out or something. But uh, we are going to launch a, an, another service starting not, not now and not in the summer, but in the fall. On October 16th, we're going to be launching a Wednesday night service. And so that Wednesday night service will be the exact same thing as what we're going to do the following Sunday. So those of you who maybe uh, have some travel plans over the weekend or you work on Sundays and you can't make it every Sunday, we want to create another opportunity for you and to invite people in this community that you love, uh, that right, right now there's not a ton of room for them. We're going to make that room starting on that, that October 16th. That Wednesday before... Uh, that would be October 9th, I believe. We're going to have a night of worship in this room at Wednesday night. It's going to be kind of a launch party for our Wednesday night service. And that Sunday in between those is our Vision Sunday. Vision Sunday, if you've never been part of Vision Sunday, it's epic, right? We, we come together. You get to hear the vision of the church for the next year. We have a party in the parking lot afterwards. Everybody gets a free shirt. It's pretty epic. So uh, all that is going to be within one week period of time in October. You don't want to miss it. Uh, all that's coming. More news will be coming as we get closer. But isn't that cool? Are you guys excited about that? All right, so we are in part five of five in the series we're doing right now where we recognize there's a war going on in, in between a, what I would call like a, a biblical worldview and the world's view, right? The, the way a lot of people, there's a cultural war going on where a lot of people want to take what you believe, what this Bible teaches, and essentially claim that we're, uh, we're essentially what they're doing is declaring war against values that we hold dear. And so we've been talking through these different values. We've been talking through what the Bible teaches and how we are called as believers to, to approach the, the, this battleground. And one of the things I feel very strongly about as your lead pastor, and I know our overseers feel this way, I know our, our staff and our other pastoral team feels this way, we feel called to be uh, like watchmen, to be to be at the, the, to have the responsibility of making sure that as a church, we all know what's going on in the world around us. Let me tell you why I take this seriously. In Ezekiel 33, it says, but if the watchman sees the enemy coming and doesn't sound the alarm to warn the people, he is responsible for their captivity. They will die in their sins, but I will hold the watchman responsible for their deaths. So as a church, I want to make sure that we have, the reason we've done this series is to have an opportunity to make sure that you're seeing certain things that are happening in our culture and in our world, and so that as a church, we're all aware that you've heard the alarm bells, you're, you're not sitting uh, ignorant to the things that are happening in the world around us. So I'm really glad we're getting an opportunity to do this. Today, specifically, we're going to wrap up the series with the war on the church, the war that's happening right now on the church. If you do me a favor and grab a copy of God's word and turn to John 17, I'm going to teach out of John 17 this morning. You can kind of put your bookmark there. If you don't own a Bible, 
I'm going to fix that right now, all right? Just grab the Bible from under the chair in front of you. If you're in the front row, you'll have to reach behind you. And write your name on that Bible and take it home with you, all right? So everybody right now owns a Bible. So go with me to John 17. Let me set up this passage. What you're going to hear in John 17 is Jesus praying a prayer. So God the Son, Jesus, is praying a prayer to God the Father, and so we get to hear this prayer that Jesus is, is praying to God the Father. And I want you to know, first of all, who is he praying about? In his prayer, there's someone on his heart. And it's important for us to know this. Here's what he says in verse 9. He says, my prayer is not for the world. Now, don't get me wrong. We, we have other verses that we know, right, that Jesus loves the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. We know that Jesus loves the world. He, he gave his life on the cross so that anyone in the world might be able to be saved through his death on the cross. So Jesus loves the world, but this prayer is not for the world. He's praying a prayer to his father specifically. Let's see what it says. For those you have given me because they belong to you. He's praying this prayer specifically for those disciples, those early church disciples And guess what? He's not only praying for them. If you fast forward to verse 20, it says this, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Guess who that is? That's us. How cool is it? Don't miss this. You get to open up God's word and actually read the words that Jesus prayed for you. He's praying this prayer over you. And over me, over this church. He says, for anyone who will ever believe in me because of the words of these disciples, I'm praying this prayer over them. So we get to hear this prayer. And what this prayer is going to show us is that as a church, we are in a war. There's a battle going on. We're going to hear some of these words come out of Jesus' mouth. It's important to know that this is a wartime church, okay? So let me show you three things from, from John 17 that I think we can pull out of this text and understand what Jesus is wanting for us. Number one, Jesus' desire for a wartime church. Number one, a desire for protection. Jesus wants you to know that he's prayed over you to the Father that you, church, would be protected. Let's read about that in verse 10. He says, all who are mine belong to you. And you have given them to me, so they bring me glory. And now I am departing from the world. They are staying in this world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name, so that they will be unified just as we are. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that not one was lost except the one headed for destruction, as the scriptures foretold. He's talking about Judas there. (laughs) He says, listen, while I was here, I I had the opportunity to, to provide protection for them using your powerful name, using the name you gave me. In Jesus' name, I was able to provide protection for these people. But now, I'm gonna go back up to be with you, Father. And so when I go up, and leave this natural world and go up and sit at your right hand, I'm praying that you will provide protection, not just for the disciples that are alive right now, but for all the people that will come to know faith, that will come to know Jesus in faith because of them. That's us. So what can we infer from the truth that Jesus prayed that we would receive protection, that we would have protection? What can you infer from that? Here's what I infer from that, is that we are going to need protection. He's praying that you will have protection. Why? Because he knows that you uh, and I, as a church, we're going to need protection. Let me show you a few things. I wrote down five things I find in Scripture that I think we need protection from, that Jesus has in mind when he's thinking about the church. The first one is this, is persecution. Jesus knows that the church is going to be persecuted, and so he's praying to God the Father, will you protect them from the persecution that's coming? Let's keep reading in verse 13. It says, now I'm coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world, so they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word. 
and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. He essentially says right here in John 17, they're going to be persecuted. The world's going to hate them because they don't belong to this world. They're, they're different. They're going to stand out. They're going to look odd, they're going to, and they're going to hate them because they're going to follow the word that I've given them. If you go earlier in the same book in John 15, you see the same thing. Here's what Jesus says in John 15, verse 18. He says, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. Listen, I want you to know that when you are persecuted, church, you're in good company. Jesus wants you to know, hey, you're gonna be persecuted, but guess what? I was the first one persecuted. And he goes on. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world, and so it hates you. Essentially what Jesus is saying to us, the church, through this passage is, listen, you all, you were born into this world, you were born into this sinful world, you have this sin nature, you were apart from Christ, you were destined to hell, you were part of, you had a citizenship of this world. And at some point, those of you who have given your life to Christ, you've said, you know what, uh, Thank you for all, I guess, the things that you've offered and, and world. Thank you for, I, I know I entered into uh, your care, but I actually now reject your way of doing things, and I choose to uh, turn in my citizenship of the world and receive a new citizenship as one of God's children. Here's what that means. You all who have given your life to Christ, you are traitors as far as the world is concerned. You've rejected All that the world has promised you and is offering you and and promising will bring joy to your life. All the things that they're doing to entice you. And you're just kind of saying, "Ah, no thanks. I want to be a citizen of heaven. And scripture says that church, when you do that, the world would love you if, if you stayed as a member of the world. If you kept your citizenship with them. The, we, we, we've seen examples of that all over the place. The world embraces those who do things the way the world does. But because we have rejected the way of the world and decided we want to follow Jesus instead, Jesus essentially says, listen, you're going to be persecuted when you do that. Here's another thing I think that Jesus is praying protection over us from is, is false teachers and false doctrine. In Second Peter chapter 2, the first verse, it says, but there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. And they will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who brought them, who bought them. It is in this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. So Jesus recognizes not only are you going to be persecuted because you reject uh, what the world says and instead uh, say, I want to do things the Bible's way, but there are going to be people who come up and say, well, listen, if you want to do things this way, let me teach you what this says, and they're going to teach you junk that's not in here. And they're going to claim that it's from Scripture. There are going to be people who teach false doctrine. They're going to teach heretical things that aren't founded in God's truth, and they're going to claim that they're real and that they're true. And some people will fall for that. And so Jesus is saying, listen, I want, to, I want to pray that you're protected from the persecution that you're going to get. But I also want to pray over you that you are protected from false teachers and false doctrine. That your minds are sharp and that you hear it when you see it. Here's another thing. Spiritual warfare. I know you could argue that everything I'm talking about so far is spiritual warfare. That's true. But I just want to call this one out specifically for just a moment. I think a lot of times we don't give enough uh, consideration to the war that's happening in the realm of that in the realm that we can't see with our eyes. Do you know that there is a war going on? That when Satan uh, w- departed and decided to leave heaven, he took a third of the angels with him. Those are demons who are now here on this world. Uh, They are wreaking havoc in your families, in your marriages, in your children, all over the place. They're doing as much damage as they can because that's what they do. And we can't see them with our eyes. One of the things I love about this church is that 7.45 a.m. every Sunday morning, 
we have a team that, that walks around this room and we pray over these seats that you're sitting in right now. We're praying for you. And one of the things I do when I pray is I'm intentional about praying and I use Jesus's name, the power of Jesus's name, and I say it out loud with my mouth. Because guess what? Satan isn't omniscient. He's not omnipotent. He's not you know, all-knowing. He doesn't know what I'm thinking. And so I use Jesus's name spoken out of my mouth because I recognize there is a battle going on right around this building and especially inside this room. Satan doesn't want you to hear anything that I say that's true. He wants to distract you in this moment. He wants, to, he wants you to get mad. He wants you to all these things. And so we pray. I, I pray in Jesus' name. Jesus, would you, in, in the powerful name of Jesus, would you make this, this property and this building, would you free it of any demonic power? Would you de- de- free it of any distraction that would keep someone from hearing and embracing your truth? There is spiritual war going on. And just because you can't see demons or you can't see Satan or you can't see the evil world around you, it, listen, it's happening. And so we have to recognize, it says in 1 Peter 5.8, it says, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Listen, lions, their whole strategy before they pounce is to be unseen and unheard. So we need to recognize that there's spiritual warfare, that Jesus is praying protection over us in his name. Uh, Another one is division. I think another thing that we need protection from is, is division. We'll talk more about that in a minute. We see that in Ephesians 4. How about this one? Another fifth one is a worldly temptation. I believe Jesus wants to pray a prayer of protection over his church that we would be able to stand up against the temptations of this world that are trying to lure us into sinful behavior. In James 1, it says this, temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. And so you think about persecution and false doctrine and you think about spiritual warfare and division and worldly temptation. Jesus is praying out of love for his church, the bride of Christ. He says, Jesus, or God the Father, would you you protect my church? I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna go be with you. They've gotta stay. Would you watch over them? And notice that when Jesus is praying his prayer, he mentions over and over again, the power of the name that you gave me, the power of Jesus' name. I want to make sure that everybody knows there is power, incredible, mighty power in the name of Jesus, spoken out loud so Satan and his demonic minions all know that there is power in the spoken name of Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches, right, in the name of Jesus demons flee. In the name of Jesus, miracles happen. One day at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. There is power in the name of Jesus. And so Jesus is praying to the Father, and he's saying, Father, I'm going to go be with you, uh, but in, in, in the mighty name you gave me, I watched over them. And now in the mighty name you gave me, would you continue to protect them? And as he's leaving, guess what? You were thinking, well, why would Jesus just abandon us? It says, in John 16, 7, he says, but in fact, it is best for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate, capital A, advocate, won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. This advocate is the Holy Spirit. See, the Bible teaches that when you give your life to Christ, you receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. Essentially, God in the person of the Holy Spirit, lives inside of you. Now, instead of Jesus, another human, standing next to you, guarding you and leading you and protecting you, you have God living inside of you, even better. And so here's how John closes this this idea of protection. In John 17, verse 15, he says, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. Here we are, we're, we're stuck here, church. And Jesus said, I'm not asking you to, to take them away from where there's, there's a battle going on. I'm asking you to keep them 
here, but to protect them while they're here. All right, here's Jesus' second desire, I think, for a wartime church, is we see a desire for them to deploy. How many of you have ever been deployed before? That word rings true in your situation. First of all, can we just thank these, these men and women for their deployment? Yeah. I want you to understand that uh, as a follower of Christ in a, in a battle, we are not a, we're not a peacetime military. There's a battle going on. And so one of the things that we find that Jesus is praying over us is he's saying, God, I want, I want my people to know that they are being sent out, that they are being deployed. They're not meant to stay comfy in their homes and to be protected from all the world and everything that's going on. And actually, Jesus is saying, in, in light of the reason you're going to need protection, is that he's actually deploying us as the church out into the world across enemy lines, across enemy territory. We are now in the world deployed to accomplish his great commission. It says in John 17, if we keep reading in verse 16, let's pick up there. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, don't miss this, just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. In other words, I am deploying them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so that they can be made holy by your truth. Let me give you a few thoughts on this passage. I was recent, maybe a month ago, someone came up and asked me a question. And he said, Pastor Matt, what are your thoughts on aliens? Do you believe in aliens? And I said, all right. It's a good question. Let me, let me I, I processed through some things. We were able to have a conversation. Let me tell you my thought on aliens, all right? Let me put my tinfoil hat on and then tell you what I believe. I believe that there are aliens, all right? There are aliens. I believe the Bible actually teaches that there are aliens. And by the way, I believe that the Bible teaches that those aliens are you. <laughs> Believer. The Bible teaches that you were not made for this world, that you are not that you're, you're just a sojourner. You're just kind of uh, working through these shadow lands, as C.S. Lewis puts it. You're not, you're not made for this world. You are an alien here. You're meant to stand out. Uh, we're, we're meant to be the ones that are coming up to the world and be like, hey, I would really like to talk to your leader, right? We're, we're the ones that are meant to be aliens in this place. I remember I went on a missions trip a little over a year ago with some other pastors to India. And we were in different little remote villages of, in, in India. And one of the things that was interesting to me, how often this happened, people would come up to me, not just me, but anyone who was with us, and they would ask for a selfie with us. And so they would take a picture, a total stranger, not someone we've developed a relationship with, just someone that just walked up to us in a market and just said, can I have a selfie? And so we're like, okay. And so we take a picture with random people. And I remember asking our guides on this trip, like, what is this about? Why, who do they think we are that they want a picture with us? And they said, well, frankly, you're white. And some, some people in some of these villages, other than on TV or in a commercial somewhere, you're the first white guy they've seen. And they're excited to be able to take a picture with you and show their friends that they saw one of you. <laughs> I'm like, that's pretty interesting to me. But think about this for just a moment. How amazing would it be if we were that set apart if we are that sanctified, go, go, this process of sanctification, right? This, this word sanctification where Jesus says, would you make them holy by your truth? Would you set them apart in this process of sanctification so that they look different? That when I put them as aliens in this place, that everyone recognizes, oh my goodness, that's different. That's otherworldly. How cool would it be if someone came up to you because of the way you respond uh, to a situation where everyone else would be furious and would be throwing fist or something and they came up and they see you full of joy somehow and they're like can I get a selfie with you I've never seen one like you before 
You see, Jesus says that he's calling us to go out into the world, to be aliens in a place that's foreign to us. And even, I want to show you something I saw in this passage that I've never seen before. I hope you see this for the first time today too, so we can all be like, wow, that's pretty cool. All right, maybe you've seen this before, but let me, this process of sanctification, think about this for just a moment. If we're being deployed, we're going across enemy lines. Let me give you this example. Have any of you ever played Capture the Flag before? Maybe you've played this with like uh, paintball guns or something where if you get tagged with a paintball gun, you're out and you got to go back. Or, or you, maybe you play with just tag, you know, tag, uh, capture the flag. Essentially, the way you play is you have a, some sort of established line, right, the halfway point. And if you're on your side of the line, you're untouchable, all right? You can go right up that line. You can make fun of the other team's moms, right? You can do whatever you want, and they can't do anything about it because you're on your side, now, the moment you step onto their side, which is eventually, you got to do it. If you're going to go capture their flag, you got to go onto their t- side, and you got to sneak over and get the flag and somehow get back to your side. That's the whole point of the game. Uh, but once you step onto their side, well, now you're free game, right? They can shoot you with the paintball gun, shoot you with the airsoft gun, tag you, take you to jail, whatever it is. Uh, once you're past the line, you're on enemy territory. Well, God is deploying us into enemy territory. Now, any of you have ever been deployed and you're going onto the battlefield, the moment you recognize, hey, we're no longer safe in the land that we're standing on, what are you probably wearing? You're probably wearing camos of some sort, right? You're being intentional about not standing out. You want to be as hidden as possible. You want to, to, to blend in with your surroundings as to not put a big target on your back. But essentially in this passage, the same passage that Jesus says, I'm going to send them into the world across enemy lines. It's the same passage where he says, and I want them to stand out. It's essentially saying, listen, I want you to go across enemy lines where now you're free game for whatever arrows and paintball guns and all, all, whatever's going to come your way, and I want you to do it wearing a neon jumpsuit. <laughs> Wait, what? Now we can see why Jesus is praying for our protection as we're deployed into this world. He says, I want you to go into enemy territory. This world is not meant for you. You're gonna, the world's going to hate you. And I know that when you're in a world that hates you, it's probably easier just to kind of hide. I don't want you to hide. I want you to put on something so bold and obnoxious that everybody knows that you're, you're where you're not supposed to be. Where you're, you're where you're not meant to live forever. You're, you're standing out to make a difference. And so he's praying this protection over us. Let me show you the third thing I think Jesus is desiring for the wartime church. Number three, He desires unity, a desire for unity. We keep reading in John 17. Let's pick back up in verse 21. He says, I pray that they will all be what? One. Just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that they, so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. I in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. You know what's interesting about this passage? He actually says one of the ways that the enemy is going to see us, one of our, our, our neon jumpsuit that we're wearing one of the reasons they're going to notice us is because of our unity. It's not just one guy crawling somewhere. They're going to see a whole, a whole slew of us, like all coming all at once. And they're going to know, whoa, something's going on there. You see, Satan knows his opponent. He, he knows what's worked in the past. He knows what's worked to create the most havoc and chaos in this world and in our families and in our marriages. And one of the things that he knows works is to divide people. If he can get people to turn on each other, especially within the church. You know, there's, there's so many churches in every community because we just like to divide over things. He's like, man, how, how many ways can I get these people to turn on each other? 
And yet we understand that we've been called to be the body of Christ, right? Jesus is the head and we are the body. And you've heard this before from me, right? What do you call it when you walk into a room and there's detached body parts all over the place? We call that a crime scene, okay? Something horrific has gone on in that room. For a lot of us, that's the way we, we, we think the church looks, right? We go in there and it's just the church detached, uh, these different people detached. That's not what the church is. The church is a attached, connected body of Christ where we're unified and marching together as one. There's a, a, a quote that's often mentioned in military circles. It says, there are no atheists in foxholes. If you notice that when you find yourself across enemy lines, when you find yourself in a dangerous situation, it's incredible how there's an immediate camaraderie that's built because you know, I mean, think about this for a moment. Would you rather go into battle by yourself or would you rather go into battle with someone on your six? If you don't know what that means, you know, imagine a clock, you're looking straight ahead, that's 12 o'clock. On your six means you have someone on your back watching what's going on behind you. Would you rather go in by yourself or someone on your six? Thank you. Yeah, I, I know I, it's got to be a trick question. It's too easy. Not a trick question. How about this? Would you rather go into battle with someone on your six or someone on your six and your three and your nine? I don't know about you, but I want to go into battle with brothers and sisters in Christ standing around me saying, listen, we know the strategies of Satan wants to divide us and get us alone. And when we're alone, we're easy to conquer. But man, we're called to be unified. So Jesus is praying over this wartime church. Would you let them be protected as I'm deploying them across enemy lines? And would you let them go across enemy lines united as a body of Christ? Let them protect each other. You see, I want you to know this for a minute. God designed the church to worship together. We know that. We all agree that God designed us to worship together. But let me, let me open your eyes a little bit. Do you know I believe God also designed the church to throw down together? You might be thinking, but that's not the way Jesus would have taught. Jesus was like a turn-the-other-cheek guy. He was always about being nice to people and being kind and loving. And so the pastor's telling us that we're supposed to go out and we're supposed to throw down together. Hold on. Let me make this really clear. Who's our enemy in this? All right, when you're playing a game of chess and you got someone on the other side and you, here you are and that, that rook comes over and kills your queen, are you pretty upset in that moment? Yes or no, right? We're all pretty upset in that moment. My queen just got knocked out. Now, in that moment, are you upset with the rook? Are you upset with the person controlling the rook? You got to remember who our enemy is. The Bible's really clear. We're going to talk about this in just a moment as we close. But listen, our enemy is not a flesh and blood enemy. I'm not telling you to go out there and throw down against other people who've been blinded by the enemy. They're not the enemy. Your neighbor's not the enemy. Your coworker's not the enemy. That troll on Facebook is not the enemy. They feel like the enemy. They're, they're the rook who just took out your queen, but they're being controlled by something else. The evil demonic forces of the unseen world, and we as a body of Christ, we have to throw down against evil spirits. You have my permission to hate evil. We're gonna hate Satan. We're going to hate the havoc and the chaos that he, he, he produces. We're going to throw down together against the evil that ex, that's being experienced in this world. We're not going to throw down against our blind brothers and sisters that are, they're, I guess not our brothers and sisters, our blind coworkers and neighbors. We want them to join our side so we can throw down together with them. So how do we do this? I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to close with a passage of scripture from Ephesians chapter 6. And since we are the church and we're the body of Christ, I would love to have someone read these next three verses for me. I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10, 11, and 12. I don't know if I have a, a brother or sister in Christ who would be willing to, to read this into a microphone for me. I'm going to pick Matt Hannikin. All right, right over here. All right, we got a mic coming to you. I'm going to put the verses up on the screen to make it real easy for you. Am I, 
Go ahead. That one? You start. No, just you. You, 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 you me, read. Me, you. Okay. You. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. So this verse, this is like Paul. Like, this is like a locker room speech, right? This is his final word. This is the halftime. The team's down, and the coach is, like, giving that halftime speech. So I need you to, I need to try again. Let's go then. All okay. Right. Hey, everybody, a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on hold all up, of hold God. Up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Sorry, man. I don't know. I, we're down by a lot, okay? How much? So the coach, in my mind, is standing on a chair. Oh, I don't my know. goodness. Are we going to do this? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> all right, all yeah. Right. Here all we right. go. All right. Woo. All right. Do I have a, can I have a, I can't, I can't read it out of my version, but I'm going to hold my version. Okay, okay, you got it. All right. All right. Let's do it. Man, a final word, everybody. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Hmm. Against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Couldn't have done it better. Thank you. Heads up next time. <laughs> you have the heads up. It's not fun. For me. Remember, that verse reminds us that our enemy is not the flesh and blood. It's not your neighbor. It's not your coworker. It's not the person that's going to cut you off on your way to lunch today out in the parking lot. It's not that person. Just like that chess example I gave, Right? We have the evil rulers of this unseen world, Satan himself controlling a third of the angels that came to this earth with him. That's our enemy that we need to be willing to throw down together against. And so let me keep reading. It says in verse 13 of Ephesians 6, therefore put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be still, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body of armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to borrow from this passage of scripture for our what now God. Like what is our, our charge? What is the application from this message that I want you to take and go out into this world and apply according to not only what we read about in John 17, Jesus' prayer, but also in Ephesians 6 what Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus in this locker room speech. He's saying, listen, I need you to take on a couple of challenges here. Here's the first thing, church. You ready? We need to suit up. We need to put on that fluorescent orange jumpsuit. We don't need to put on our jumpsuit. We're going to put on Jesus's armor. It's going to stand out. I promise you, when you look like Jesus in this world, they hated him already for it, and they're going to hate you for it. So we need to suit up. The Bible says, don't put on your own armor, put on God's armor. It's much better than yours. The second thing is to stand firm, right? Figure out wherever you need to put your feet, be ready to stand firm. And listen, if you fall over, sometimes it happens. Get back up. We're called to be standing firm, not lying down, not sitting down, not hanging out in our living room, lazy boy. We're called to be standing firm for the truth of the gospel. There's a war going on. You know, Roman armor is interesting in that there's only protection on the front. It's as if to say, listen, if you turn around and you try to retreat, you're opening yourself to attack. You're gonna get shot in the back. And so we're gonna be wearing God's armor. We're gonna look at evil straight on and say, listen, 
We're a church that doesn't put up with this. We're a church that's gonna stand firm against this. Number three, we're called to stay alert with prayer, to keep our eyes open, paying attention to what's going on in the world around us, and all the while be praying through it. Letting that Holy Spirit that lives inside of us guide us and direct us, protect us. You see, church, we already have everything we need for victory. And here's how that John 17 passage, at least the last verse I want to read today to wrap it up, verse 24. Jesus says, Father, I want these whom you have given me, or given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. What Jesus is saying is, listen, church, right now, you're stuck here. But one day, he's gonna call you home. One day, if you've given your life to Christ, you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, he's covered for your sin. And one day, through Jesus, who's the way, the truth, and the life, you will be reconnected to Jesus, who wants to be with you. He wants to call you to be with him. But right now, you're here fighting this battle together with the church. Let's, let's expect persecution. Let's recognize we're deployed, right? Let's be unified, standing firm in God's armor, ready to, to stay alert in prayer. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this opportunity you've given us as a church to gather together this morning. Thank you for the reminders that you constantly give us from your word that we are in a battlefield that there is a war, a culture war going around us. There's a, a supernatural battle that's going on around us. And we are here, and, and you love us so much, you prayed to the Father that, that, that we would be protected, and even in the midst of being across enemy lines. God, that we help us be unified as we stand on each other's, uh, as we have each other's backs in this battle. Help us to, to stand firm and pray through it all. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Wow, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.